today. Raise the collapse, raise the collapse. A New York City cop who was called to be downtown after 9-11. There was this eerie silence. Nobody was talking. Plus. It was obvious that this was a really bad accident. Haunted by a crash. It wouldn't be surprising if it was a fatal. One sheriff goes searching for answers. I guess I was looking for something that was missing. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. With just under two months to go, the presidential race is getting closer every day. And now a new poll shows Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in very tight races in four key swing states. Clinton's been falling in the polls as more headlines have come up about her email problems. And as Charlene Aaron reports, Trump is still bringing it up on the campaign trail. With just 59 days till the election, Hillary Clinton is still facing questions and attacks over her email controversy. Donald subject. Trump took shots at her over the issue Thursday while speaking in Cleveland. Remember, Hillary Clinton was emailing about the drone program, among many other extremely sensitive matters. This is yet more evidence that Clinton is unfit to be your commander in chief. Clinton has claimed that she didn't send or receive any email with classified marking. But a new report from Fox News says that a Clinton email had classified markings on virtually every paragraph. Meanwhile, Clinton talked freely about her faith to the National Baptist Convention, the oldest African American Baptist denomination. Speaking in Kansas City, Missouri Thursday, she said, Sometimes people ask me, are you a praying person? And I tell them if I wasn't one before. <laughs> Woo. One week living in the White House or on the campaign trail would have turned me into a praying person. Clinton's lead over Trump has been dropping in the polls in recent days, but the race will, as always, come down to the Electoral College, especially in the swing states. And the polls show that the race is getting tighter in four of the key states. In a new Quinnipiac poll that also includes the two independent candidates, Trump has a slight lead in Ohio, while the Republican and Democrat are tied in Florida, with Clinton holding slim leads in Pennsylvania and North Carolina. Clinton still appears to have the lead in the Electoral College, but the campaign is far from over, and both candidates are likely to focus the last two months of the campaign on the battleground states, where the race will almost certainly be decided. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. If you're not registered to vote, please go out and register. You're going to be running out of time uh, on a lot of states on their laws of how uh, close to an election you can become registered to vote and please make plans to vote. This is going to be one of the tightest presidential races uh, in my opinion in history. Well in other news North Korea has conducted its largest nuclear test yet. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. North Korea says its latest and most powerful test could allow it to build stronger but smaller and lighter nuclear weapons. South Korea reports the blast felt like a magnitude 5 earthquake. The explosive yield was reportedly 70 to 80 percent of the force of the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. South Korea says the test showed the fanatic recklessness of the Kim Jong-un government. Well, advocates for the persecuted church are urging Christians here in the U.S. to help their fellow believers suffering intense persecution in the Middle East. CBN's Abigail Robertson brings us that story. The greatest humanitarian crisis of our era is unfolding in the Middle East with Christian populations facing genocide. A group called In Defense of Christians organized three days of events in Washington, aimed not only at getting lawmakers to address this issue, but also to discuss how American believers can get involved. The sad reality is we're seeing things actually get worse. Uh, in Iraq, in Syria, uh, even in Lebanon, we're seeing increasing challenges facing our communities there. So I I think uh, we've yet to turn the corner and yet to kind of uh, sort of 
witness any of the progress that we'd like to see. Leaders from In Defense of Christians say one of the greatest hopes for ending Christian persecution in the Middle East is by bringing awareness to evangelical Americans who can advocate for their brothers and sisters around the world. What the Middle East Christian and diaspora are very often saying is once this is issue ends up in the hands of American evangelicals, that will be the thing that changes the issue and saves Christianity in the Middle East. Duran suggested American churches can help by adopting a refugee family, sponsoring trips to safer parts of the Middle East, and lobbying elected officials to create safe havens for those suffering. Engaging in advocacy, calling their members of Congress, calling their elected representatives, telling them that they care about the Christians of the Middle East. I think the leaders from the evangelical community taking site visits all around the Middle East, going to refugee camps, going to IDP camps, telling the Christians that they, that they care, showing them that they care, and then figuring out humanitarian and political solutions to the problems that they face. IDC and other groups believe that if enough congressmen fight the issue, the administration will be pushed to get involved too. Generation Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abigail. The long legal saga for former Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell is over. Federal prosecutors have announced they will not pursue a second trial against McDonnell or his wife. The Justice Department said it made that determination after reviewing the Supreme Court's decision back in June to throw out McDonnell's corruption conviction. McDonald had originally been sentenced to two years in prison. He says he now plans to commit his life to serving others outside the political arena. And Gordon, as the Washington Post put it, he's free now, but a hefty price to pay for his freedom. Uh, he was at one point in time on a short list for vice president nominations. Uh, it is a hefty price that Bob and Maureen have paid for this. Uh, and uh, our hearts go out to him, as well as congratulations that the saga is now over, and we look forward to the next stage of their lives where they're going to be serving others outside of the political arena. Terry? Well, still to come, a member of New York City's finest who saw the worst of humanity, and that was before 9-11. I couldn't process that in my brain. It was just building and building and building. The pressure was just building. One of the guys I work with, he said, hey, you look like you're going to explode. Watch this police officer confront his inner demons when we return. Well, Sunday marks the 15th anniversary of the day that changed everything, 9-11. Americans watched in horror to the reports of our cities on fire, and when Billy and his wife saw it happen, they knew they needed to help. U.S. Army soldier Billy didn't plan on a career in the armed forces, but 9-11 changed his mind. When I saw those towers fall, I mean, I really connected to, you know, serving your country. I needed to focus on what it means to be an American and doing my part. Billy joined the Army and deployed to the front lines, leaving his wife Lindsay behind, pregnant with their first child. Lindsay supported his decision to enlist and trusted God to bring him home. Every military wife has that fear. Will they come back? You just kind of let go. You put your trust in God. You just take one day at a time. Since that first year, the couple has navigated through multiple deployments and raised four kids. Lindsay says Billy does a great job balancing his career and family. I'm very proud of Billy giving all this time to our country, to our family, um, and being the example that he has been. Billy believes it's Lindsay who deserves the recognition. The spouses are the backbone of this country because without them, there's no way we could do anything, you know, and do what we do. The family dynamics changed dramatically when the couple took in two siblings being raised by their grandmother. When she got sick and could no longer care for them, Billy and Lindsay were approved to adopt the boys. That meant reworking the family budget. We had to analyze our finances. My mind was racing. Looking at our finances in our current situation, God's guiding us so I know that he's always provided. He continues to provide. Billy and Lindsay are members of First Baptist Church Colleen near Fort Hood, Texas. The church contacted Helping the Homefront and asked if CBN could help with the adoption fees. We said yes. 
Pastor Randy Wallace stopped by to let them know that CBN would help. They wanted to provide y'all with $5,000 to help with the future legal fees. And we as a church are thrilled to be a part of that as well. And that wasn't the only surprise. They want to take you on a shopping spree to Sears, and they're wow. going to spend hundreds of dollars today with you at Sears, wow. making sure that your kids have fresh tennis shoes. And blue jeans. And whatever else y'all need. Thank you. We ought to do more than just stand back and, and applaud. And that's where uh, the, their organization has already come to the table with that. That is cool. Which one do you like? CBN took the family shopping to buy what they needed to accommodate all the children. Now this Army family can focus on finalizing the adoption with a little less financial stress. Helping the home front has definitely changed our story and could definitely change other military family stories to make a dream come true that they didn't even know they could even ask for. We're so thankful. And we're thankful to you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, thank you, because you're a part of that. If you're not a member, we invite you to join. It's real simple. All you have to do is call us. 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to be a member of the 700 Club. And when you call, ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving, where the bank does all the work, and we send as our gift to you, Power for Life, monthly teaching CDs. So if you like those, ask for Pledge Express. And if you want to designate your gift to Helping the Home Front, you can do that. All you have to do is say uh, on the phone, I want to give to Helping the Home Front. Uh, what we want to do is help military families and recognize that the families of our service members are serving as well. And we want to help them in their time of need. So often there's more month than money for them. And we want to bridge that gap so that we recognize their service as well. If you want to be a part of it, call us. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, the late Mr. Rogers once said, when you see scary things in the news, look for the helpers. After the 9-11 attacks, Andrew Columbia was one of those helpers. At a time when his fellow neighbors and countrymen were struggling, Andrew was a shoulder to lean on, thanks to a showdown he once had with God. I went down there the day after the attacks took place. I was on the task force with other pastors and ministers. There was this eerie silence. There were people all over the place, but nobody was talking. I was in shock and I was praying, Lord, give me the strength to be able to minister here. I grew up in uh, Staten Island, New York. I thought I lived a pretty normal life like most kids. My mother and father, we were nominal churchgoers. I excelled in sports. I, I, I did well in school when I applied myself, but there was just something inside. I always felt like there was something wrong with me and I didn't know why. I didn't handle rejection well. If somebody didn't like me, it really bothered me. I would say, what's wrong with me? Why do I feel afraid? Why do I feel insecure? When you're feeling insecure, it's hard to think you're worthy of anything. Was I worthy of love? Hmm. I don't know. That kind of festered over the years. And then as I got older and went into my teen years, that's where the anger started coming in. There were times where I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd be literally shaking. I knew in my heart that there was something deep that wasn't right. I was afraid to deal with it. January 20th of 1987, 21 years old, I was a, a macho guy. I didn't look afraid. I didn't look insecure. I think I had most people fooled. Then I'd become a cop. Now I have a platform to be aggressive. Now I have an outlet for anger. I would not take crap from nobody. If, if you were gonna say something to me that I didn't like, I was gonna give it back to you. 
I don't care if you were a sergeant or a captain or whoever. This one sergeant in particular, he goes, Columbia, I'm sending you to the Fighting Ninth. And I said, the Fighting Ninth, where's that? He goes, that's the Lower East Side of Manhattan, just where you belong. Well, the Lower East Side from mid to late 80s into the 90s was one of the roughest areas in New York City. It was the drug capital of the country. And the symbol for the precinct was an outhouse. It was a precinct where you got your hands dirty. There probably wasn't a week that went by that I wasn't breaking up a fight, dealing with an emotionally disturbed person, someone who's whacked out on drugs or just crazy. I saw situations where little children were raped, three-year-olds bleeding, uh, crying. I couldn't process that in my brain. When I saw a child being hurt, I wanted vengeance. It would infuriate me. If a woman was beat up by her boyfriend, he was going to pay. I'm seeing this stuff every day, trying to be a father and a husband and raise a family. I got the pressure of the job. It was just building and building and building. The pressure was just building. One of the guys I work with, he said, you know, Columbia, you look like you're going to explode. Now it's like, OK, you're found out. You can't hide it anymore. That night, I decided to have a showdown with God. I went up to that roof that night, and I began to curse at God and scream at God. Everything that was in me, all that emotion, all that anger, all that frustration, I just had to let it out. And I took my gun out, and I waved it in the air, and I said, God, if you're real and you're there, what's stopping me from blowing my brains out right now? I want to know what's wrong with me. What is wrong with me? I want to know now. And when I did that, that's where everything changed. Words came out of my mouth. You were molested as a child. And I said, God, if that's real, I want another sign. And the words came out of my mouth again. You were molested as a child. And I said, God, if that's real, I want another sign. And the third time, I felt this presence that I never felt before, this light encased around me. I just felt love. It was the answer to my fear. It was the answer to my insecurity. It was the answer to my pain. I saw God as this loving father who cared enough about me to be honest with me. He exposed the deepest secret in my life that I was afraid to face or deal with. And he gave me a whole new life. You know, one of the things we had to do was on a Sunday morning, we'd have to walk up 10 flights of stairs to go to the top of buildings when we get a call Sunday morning to chase the homeless guys off the roof. I would get up there and I was mean to those guys. After I got saved, I remember one time I went up to the roof. There was this guy urine and vomit all over. And I looked at this guy, and, and I was overwhelmed with compassion. And I walked over to him, and I said, do you know that God loves you? Do you know that? And this man started crying. And I hugged him, and I prayed with that man on the roof. God changed my heart so much that what he did for me, I knew he can do for anyone else. People went through this traumatic event of 9-11 on so many levels. They were so traumatized by that event, it affected other events in their life. And I was able to help people process that. It was a beautiful thing to be able to help people in that time. I believe this, there's a time and season for every human being to have their encounter with God. And for me, it was 26 years old. Ecclesiastes 3, it says there's a time and a season for everything. And God's waiting for people to see if he's real.
Here's what Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And it's not just the truth of your past history or um, your feelings, your inner being. It's also the truth of who he is. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you have something in your life today that's hindering your relationship with the one who created you, that's keeping you from knowing what your purpose here is, your value here, if you feel like those are all things that are issues for you, will you call and pray with one of our people here today? There, there are people just like you, just like me, who've come to know the forgiving, all-encompassing love of God. And they're here today just to pray with you. Our line is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. We'd love to have you call and pray with someone today. Jesus is real and what he wants to do in your life is just as real as what he wanted to do and did do in Andrew's life. That's why we share that story with you to say what he did for Andrew, he can do for you. Don't walk away from him, walk toward him. He's the answer. Well, still ahead, a life-altering car crash, not because someone died in an accident, but because someone didn't. Her mother looked at me and said, we, we could be planning a funeral right now, and Katie's alive. Hear why that caused him to question everything he knew. That's later on today's show. Coming up later, from LA Law to live on the 700 Club, we'll sit down with actor Corbin Burnson. So don't go away. With people who want to do what we do, make moves. We are in the final day of our fall week of prayer, but we're only beginning our 40-day campaign to pray for America. You can get more information on that by going to PrayForAmerica.com. Yesterday, our staff here at CBN, along with those at Operation Blessing and Regent University, met at our chapel to pray for our nation and for the requests that many of you have sent to us. Our featured speaker for the event was Pastor Mark Strong. Take a look. The infinite God of the universe will give us the strength, will give us the encouragement, and give us the fortitude that we need to keep going and get the job done. <laughs> Key to seeing God's kingdom happen here on earth is that critical piece called prayer. Can I submit to you today that God can still do something great? Maybe you have issues going on in your marriage. Maybe there are issues with your children. Maybe you have issues going on in your own physical body. Can I tell you that prayer has the power to change situations? You and I both have to forgive if we're going to pray to move mountains and change situations. Well, as we mentioned earlier, we are in the beginning stages of our Pray for America campaign, which began on Monday. It's going to run until Friday, October the 14th. And here's what we'd like you to do. Go to PrayForAmerica.com and make your pledge to pray for our country during this time. Our goal is to have all 50 states covered in prayer during this 40-day period. And you can check out your state's progress online. Let us know that you are committed to praying by going on to social media and hashtagging Pray for America CBN. You can also show people that you're a prayer warrior by getting this free Pray bumper sticker. It all comes in this packet. Some of you have received it, but if you haven't received it, call and get it as well. It shows off your statement of faith in God and encourages others to pray as well. You can get your bumper sticker by going to PrayForAmerica.com or you can call our new phone number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Let me give you that again. It's 1-800-700-7000. That's easy to remember. So call and get your pray sticker. Pardon. All right, and it's time to pray. Mm -hmm. We've gotten some prayer requests in. Uh, a financial miracle to repair the roof on our house. Mm -hmm. Healing of mental illness, bipolar, depression. Uh, husband to be free of PTSD, depression, feelings of worthlessness. Healing and restoration for relationships with family, friends, church members, and then parents and children. What do you have? Well, I've got someone saying we would like prayer that God would restore the cartilage to my knee. Someone else saying we, I need healing from breast cancer affecting both breasts for the last two years. 
and then prayer for a homeless Vietnam POW who is a new Christian, needs prayer and support for his growth as a believer. Someone saying, we need deliverance from nicotine for a couple who both suffer from congestive heart failure and COPD. And those are the four that I'm holding here, but there are thousands more that have come in. Well, let's pray for them and pray, pray for you. And let's also pray for America. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to come together as a nation. And regardless of who wins an election, we need to realize we have to unify. Uh, there are enemies against us in the world today. And we need to be one nation under God, indivisible. Mm -hmm. So let's pray. Lord, we lift these needs to you uh, and the people, your people, your children who are suffering. And whether it's disease in their body or financial needs or relationships that need to be restored or forgiveness for what they have done. Lord, you are the answer to every human need. And so we lift them to you. We lift them to your throne of grace. We lift them to your mercy seat. And we ask for mercy, Lord mm -hmm. God. In your mercy, Lord God, just stretch forth your hand to forgive, to restore. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray for our nation during this critical time of prayer that you would remind us every day to seek your face to turn to you, to have no king but King Jesus. And Lord, that we would be instruments of your peace, instruments of your wisdom, instruments of your healing, God, that our nation might become whole and once again under you, Lord. Amen. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for establishing America. We thank you for drawing people to come here that they might live free mm -hmm. and worship freely and have freedom of speech, freedom yes, of religion. Jesus freedom of assembly. You established this place, a place of refuge for all the nations of the world. Lord, have mercy on America and turn us once again to you. Restore us for righteousness exalts a nation. Restore us, Lord God, for we ask it in Jesus' name, mm -hmm. amen and amen. Join with us in this 40 days of prayer for America. We need to pray uh, like never before and realize that it starts with the church. Are, are we living as Christians? Ask yourself that. Are you living as a Christian? Uh, you call yourself that. You're taking the name. You're saying, I, I'm a follower of Jesus. But examine yourself during these 40 days. And if there's any shortfall, repent of it. Turn to God. Realize that he is full of compassion and mercy. He wants you with him for all eternity. And so have this be a time of restoration, of healing for yourself. And then lift up your church, your neighborhood, your street, your city, and especially your nation, that we could once again be one nation under God. Well, yesterday we showed you the story of a young woman named Katie Lentz who miraculously survived a head-on collision. Now we want you to see the other side of that story. Sheriff Richard Adair was the first man who arrived on the scene after that near fatal crash. And what he saw that day changed his life. Here's why. Traffic was stopped and I actually drove right up to the remains of this green Mercedes. And it was on its side with the roof facing me as I pulled up. On August 4th, 2013, Deputy Richard Adair of the Ross County Sheriff's Department in Missouri responded to an accident involving two cars in a head-on collision. It was obvious that this was a really bad accident. It wouldn't be surprising if it was a fatal. The girl, the driver, Katie, all I could see was the top of her head and one hand that was sticking out. I actually held her hand and talked to her and tried to calm her. But none of his training or 30 years of experience prepared him for what came next. She said she wanted to pray out loud. And then I became mortified. <laughs> 
Richard had grown up in church, but to him, prayer was just an empty ritual to a far away, uncaring God. I didn't know how to pray out loud. I knew, you know, the Our Father, I knew the Hail Mary. I didn't know how to pray out loud. That, for me personally, was mortifying. Curtis White, the gentleman there, I asked, can you pray with her? Yes, no problem. And he took her hand and I made the excuse to go check the other driver, the other vehicle. The other driver suffered minor injuries, but had been drinking and charged with a DUI. As for Katie, it took fire crews two hours to safely cut her out of the tangled wreckage, and put her on a chopper to the nearest trauma unit. Meanwhile, Richard couldn't stop thinking about the young woman who, despite being in excruciating pain and holding on to life, continued asking people to pray. Katie never screamed. She never cried out loud. She never cursed. She never was angry. All she did was pray out loud. And I just couldn't believe that as, as a 50-some-year-old man, how that young girl had that much faith in God, and I didn't. That's because over the past year, Richard had been trying to come to terms with the disappointments and failures in his own life and was searching for meaning and purpose. You know, I wanted to go to church. I guess I was looking for something that was missing. Then later, Richard and his wife, Debbie, visited Katie and her family at Blessing Hospital in Quincy, Illinois. I looked at my wife and I said, I can't believe how happy everybody is. Like, it's almost like we're at a birthday party. And her mother looked at me and she said, we, we could be planning a funeral right now and Katie's alive. And because of God's grace, Katie's alive. Finally, Richard understood what he had been struggling with. I was missing a relationship with God. I had no relationship with God. Soon afterwards, Richard and Debbie went to a local church service. I knew the first time I was there, we were talking about God and Jesus, and it just, it clicked. I, I don't know how to explain it. It just, I knew at that moment, it was like someone opening your eyes for the first time. In the coming months, Richard started reading the Bible and praying. As he did, he came to understand and accept God's love and forgiveness. During that time, he committed his life to Jesus Christ. I realized that I had to become right with, with God and correct things. I had to let, let go of anger that I held against others and just let it go. It's not, not for me to judge. It's over. Release that. Let it go. As he grew in his relationship with God, the people he felt he needed to share his new faith with the most were his children. I'd never even talked to my own children about God. I mean, they went to parochial schools. They, you know, did all the sacraments that our religion had you do, things I failed to teach them. And that was hard. It's, I mean, <sighs> it's not easy going to your children, your grown children, and saying, hey, I messed up. I didn't know God and didn't know how to show you who God was. As Richard lived out his faith, Debbie and his children also made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Harry, I'm a 53-year-old man who's 30 years as a cop, and I'm filling up because it's emotional. And it is. It's it's um, it's hard to explain. It's, sometimes it's hard to put into words. God used Katie that day in her suffering. And it's all because of a young woman, a stranger, who had the faith to pray. It's a simple prayer is just talking to God and having that relationship to be able to do that. It's just talking to God, but knowing that relationship, knowing Him, knowing that He's there, knowing that in Him we live and move and have our being, that He's not far away, He's not off some cloud sitting on a throne. He's right there. He's all around you. And when you have that understanding, you have that relationship, then that conversation, that prayer gets very easy. 
And then your ears are opened and you can actually hear his voice. And you can see him move in the most difficult times of life. You know that he's there and he's a comfort for you. If you don't know him, if you've never heard his voice, if just like Richard you're saying, I wouldn't even know how to pray for somebody. I wouldn't know how to do that. I want this to be your day where you meet him and you understand that he is able to take care of all of it. Where you can have that presence of love all around you, in you, overflowing. All it takes is that simple prayer, that simple request. Jesus, if you're there, if this is real, could you show me? And if you pray that with all of your heart, you're not playing games with God, but you're asking with all of your heart, he'll answer. He'll come to you because that's what Jesus does. He leaves the 99 to go search for the one, and that's you. If this is for you, don't turn away. Right now, let's pray together and let Jesus do all the rest. Pray with me. Jesus. That's right. Just say his name and say it out loud. Jesus. Say it out loud like you're talking directly to him. Jesus. I come to you and I ask that you come into my life into my heart, that you would reveal yourself to me. Jesus, you, you know the things that I've done wrong. You know the things where I've fallen short. And I ask that you forgive that. But more importantly, I want you in my life. I want to know you. I want this relationship. So hear my prayer. Come into my heart. And if you'll do this, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask that you would just manifest, turn on the light so they can see Open their ears that they can hear your voice and let your presence right now fill them to overflowing. Overwhelm them with your love, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to go to the phone and tell somebody you did. The Bible says that if you'll believe in your heart, and then confess with your mouth. What do you have to believe? You have to believe in Jesus, that he's the Messiah, that he came, that he died for your sins, that he rose again. If you believe that in your heart and then confess it with your mouth, you shall be saved. So we've made it easy for you. All you have to do is call a number, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I prayed with that guy on TV, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. When you call, I've got something free for you. It's a CD teaching. What do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? It's also got a packet filled with Bible verses. It's all free. Phone calls free. Packets free. No financial obligation at all. All you have to do is call. 1-800-700-7000. Terry, over to you. Coming up later, a timeless story gets a modern day twist. Corbin Burnson takes us inside in Lawfully Yours right after this. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Tim Tebow is joining the New York Mets baseball family. The former NFL player will be getting some baseball training before playing for the Mets in the minor leagues. He'll get a crash course at the Mets training camp in Florida while playing instructional league games. But Tebow has a long road before possibly entering the big leagues 
Experts say he has an impressive batting practice power, but struggles against former major league pitchers. Operation Blessing in Peru has changed a family's life for the better. Teddy, a single father, has been caring for his ailing daughter, Zeta. She's suffering from infections caused by parasites. When not taking care of Zeta, he's working, trying to provide for his entire family. Because of his small and broken down home, space was limited for him to cook. Operation Blessing Peru saw his struggle and was able to provide Zeta's medicine and build the family a new house. Now, thanks to Operation Blessing, Teddy and his children can look forward to a healthy and happy future. And you can find out more about Operation Blessing by going to their website at ob.org. Gordon and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club right after this. We'll take a classic story, a popular actor, and add in a world-class university. The result? The brand new faith-based film called In Lawfully Yours. Take a look. I'm Naomi's daughter-in-law. I divorced her son. But it's not bad, it's good, because he was the worst. Jess. Ma'am. Today's sermon is on the... Oh, how do you know if this is the one true religion? Oh good, an easy one. The church could use some help. Would you be my boss? Yes. Can I date my boss? You still angry? Yeah. The acoustics in here are great for shouting. What have you got against me? I'm sorry that I pushed you. I needed you to push me. I needed you. The producer and director of In Lawfully Yours is Corbin Burnson, and he's here with us now. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Thank you. Thank you. I must make a correction. I did not direct this one. You did. Produced, produced it and acted it. in it. Well, how know. did you get involved in it? Well, I was here on the 700 Club, <laughs> where all things start. <laughs> it's the beginning it's kind of, of you. everything is right it's here. Kind of you. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, and um, I was promoting another film that I had done, and uh, somebody had mentioned that there was this wonderful on campus here at Regent, this wonderful film mm -hmm. uh, school, uh, school. And, yeah. and I went over there, looked at the facilities, worked with Dr. Mitchell and over there and said, yes, let's make a movie. Let's it. You know, making a movie is one thing. Making a movie yeah. about faith is a, another part of it. But there's another element and there is something that my mother taught me. I really enjoy. I think it's a, the responsibility of us, all of us to pass knowledge. And uh, I really enjoyed passing the knowledge and allowing students to work on this film. It's 70 of them, 70 to 80 of them wow. at any given time, real jobs. I mean, you see it right there. And uh, what an it was great. incredible opportunity. I it's, mean, you come away from school with a resume with of actual a real, work. A movie, yeah, a real movie, exactly. yes. Exactly. I hate to say real movie because it sounds so, <laughs> but a, a proper ones, credit but, that's actually being yes. just, you know, distributed, distributed yeah, and yeah, seen yeah. By, by thousands and of And it turned out millions. to be a wonderful movie, too. Yeah. They can be proud of. Yeah, talk a little bit about it, because it's unique. It's actually a modern-day take right. on a very old biblical story. Well, you know, this gets a little bit tricky to talk about, and some people in your audience will understand it, and some will not understand it, and that's fair, because God <laughs> wants me to do what God wants me to do. <laughs> exactly. And I, I, I don't want to say there's a crossover, but there's a new generation of young people of faith. And you know, I saw in that last segment, praying for people to learn how to talk to God. People mm -hmm. don't know, they don't go to church, they may not do this, it might be in the internet. People don't know how to start that conversation. That's very important mm -hmm. to me and it's probably yeah. the critical theme in all my films and it reflects my own journey. Because mm -hmm. if you just say it's, can I talk to God like my neighbor? Well, yeah. it's a little different, but yes. yes. Um, so to reach a new audience, who goes and sees romantic comedies and watches television to stay within faith, Christian faith and moral values. It's mm -hmm. a tricky thing yes. because how do you blend the two? Without how a, do you without, without a, diminishing or diminishing one the real, and without yeah. alienating mm -hmm. the other? Um, you know, uh, and in this movie, we actually it came from a, a, a fellow, Sean Gaffney, who is a teacher here at mm -hmm. the university. So it, it had a moral base to it. Uh, and uh, we really, uh, I think we really hit that, I really don't like the word crossover because it's, yeah. oh, you're that and I'm this, we're all one. And, but it, it can well, appeal it's to both. like you, get, you had a nugget right. of concept and then you brought it into modern right. day and it, it's a very um, entertaining. Right. 
show, which, right. you know, is for everybody right. then. <laughs> well, uh, my, my, you know, God has instructed me this. There's one word that God keeps giving me. It's truth. Yeah. You know, if you can be true and you can stick to the moral values, and, it's, I, I, you know, I dare say I don't know, and again, I don't want to say I'm pushing boundaries, but it's a very real world out there with mm -hmm. terrible things in the news, language all around us, drug use and all that stuff. Can you not have a moral Christian character wandering through that, hearing those words mm -hmm. in a entertainment piece, entertainment, and and not alienate the Christian audience who said, I don't want to hear that word in anything I watch on DVD. It, it, it's an interesting, it's sort of a challenge. And I, I really feel like God has said, Corbin, just keep going, keep going. And I keep running up against mm -hmm. walls because I don't want that on my DVD. I don't want that language. I don't want that. I don't want to see them doing that. But that's the real world. Can we create characters that live in a real world that we can, by the way, getting back to reach new audiences and go, God's not, God's cool. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. you don't have to and think of God as not cool. and approachable and, and yes. right there. And, yeah. you know, I think that's what stops kids is, is it's like, well, God is this old fashioned thing my grandparents mm -hmm. talked about. Yeah. And it stops, it stops my own four sons. By the way, half of what I do here, admit it straight out there to all of you watching is I do this for my four sons because they're struggling as much as anybody. Sure. Well, life causes, even when you have faith, life causes you to struggle right. because of just right. the challenge sure. of it all. You play a mm. very interesting role, a small one, right. but a very significant one. Tell us. Well, I play a, I did want to give myself a little role in, there was a role of this priest um, who's in this church where Chelsea Crisp, who's wonderful, wonderful comedic, wonderful actress, you're gonna really enjoy her. She comes in and she yells at God, at, 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 at God, <laughs> Jesus, yeah. she's yelling at it all. Why, you know, why not me? Why won't you talk to me? Which goes back mm -hmm. to Corbin's. Mm -hmm. It's really the heart of the story. That's why I like the scene. And I said, that's okay. Yeah. You can yell. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to tell people, when you say a conversation with God, it doesn't have to be, oh, dear God, thank you yeah. so much for mm -hmm. my puppy. It's not, Are that's not what it is. It's yes. like, I'm hurting. Yeah. I'm angry at you. You took my child. You took my son at war. You took my, mm -hmm. why? Well, I'll, I tell people this. Great. It's a conversation. I often ask when I started searching my own faith, why you know, people, the biggest roadblocks to God and to faith are, well, obviously there's the resurrection you can talk about mm -hmm. and the immaculate conception and all of those things. But the biggest one is why does, why, how can God let these terrible things happen? Yeah. I say the minute you say, God, why? You've started a conversation. Exactly. And we don't, for me, that's the, yeah. God may need to get you in a different way. Mm -hmm. Wake you yes, up. Yes, yes. The movie, we want to mention to people, it's a, it's a wonderful. It's a comedy. It's, a, it's fun. It's, it's fun. fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we want to thank you for being with us. want people to know the movie is called In Lawfully Yours. It's Regent's first feature-length film. It's available now on DVD, digital, HD, and for streaming on Netflix. And you can find out how to get a copy by going to Regent's website. That's regent.edu. You can also go there for more information about the school, as you just heard Corbin and talk about yeah. what a great place if you're into the arts and I, I, I have to leave with that message yeah. it was an extraordinary unique experience in my life to bring 70 students yeah. into this filmmaking world and not only bring them in but succeed yeah. and uh, and we have you know the next thing planned I have a TV series plan to do right here wow what an exciting thing we want you to know we're still enrolling students for a mid-September start go to regent.edu or you can call their number it's 1-800-210-0060 Corbin Birdson thank you so much it's thank always you. great to have you thank here thank you mm -hmm. well coming up one last chance to bring it on this week we're going to answer your email questions and we'll do that right after this Time to bring it on with your email questions. And Gordon, this first one is from Aaron, who says, how do we know when we've truly forgiven someone? Clearly, God knows what's in our hearts, but how do we know we're not fooling ourselves? <laughs> Woo, overthink uh, a matter. Aaron, <laughs> Aaron you, you might want to know what's in your own heart uh, <laughs> and be honest with yourself. I have found for me forgiveness is an act. And if I'm having trouble really, truly forgiving from my heart, I need to keep on forgiving and keep on saying, I forgive, I release them. 
They owe nothing to me. I want forgiveness for what I've done, and I need to forgive them. I can't go to God with unforgiveness in my heart. I need to leave this. And then call on him to help you. You know, when you, when you finally get that breakthrough is when you don't wince anymore, when you remember what happened. And then even beyond that, you don't even remember it anymore. Uh, it's completely gone from you. Uh, and I would encourage you to keep forgiving until you get to that breakthrough. Uh, there's a whole level of joy that comes where it no longer hurts you. Uh, and one of the th problems with holding on to bitterness and revenge and I'm going to get you back and all of those kinds of feelings is that you're actually hurting yourself. And medical science says that when we do that, when we think these kinds of thoughts, we're destroying ourselves. We're affecting our immune system. We're affecting our heart function. All of these things. Get rid of it. Uh, get free from it and get to a place where you can truly love. Amen. This is a viewer who says, my daughter heard a preacher say it was imperative that we worship on the Jewish Sabbath of Saturday and that it was changed to Sunday to keep us from it. I only know the Seventh-day Adventists who worship on Saturday. Besides them, I've never heard of any church changing to a Saturday service. Does it matter? Well, it matters for the Seventh-day Adventists. Um, and, and they hold to that. And I honor them for that. Uh, within the Christian tradition, it goes all the way back to the Apostle John, and he's writing in Revelation, it was the Lord's day, and I was in the Spirit. And the Lord's day was Sunday. It was the resurrection day, which is why we celebrate Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, and if you're concerned about the Sabbath, uh, I really like a two-day weekend. Uh, and you can have both days, and you can celebrate and remember God on both. We leave you this word from Psalm 91, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways.